Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Altitude. I'm your host, Woody Woodworth. Awesome show today. We're going to do some cool stuff. We've got Mark Norman on the show today. He is the team manager and lead cloud network architect at Cloud Nation. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Folks, we're going to do some cool stuff today with Mark. We're actually going to do some screen sharing and look at art of the possible and design outcomes using Aviatrix in a modern cloud network. Now, for those folks that are on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can still enjoy the episode and just kind of visualize what we're talking about. But if you want the full experience, go to YouTube for Aviatrix and you can actually see the uh, screen presentation uh, that we're sharing and collaborating with. So Mark, um, first tell me a little bit about your role at Cloud Nation. What kind of projects are you involved with there? I've been working in IT since 1998, specializing in traditional networking from about 2000 till 2009. From then on, I fulfilled several solution architecture roles in traditional IT from 2009. And I've been working since AWS since 2017. 2018, I joined Cloud Nation. The company was just founded, and I joined a couple of months later, one of the first employees. And yeah, I've been doing lots of fun stuff since then, and uh, lots of different projects on AWS and Azure. And of course, since I have a, a background in networking, I still found cloud networking very interesting. And I noticed that it was still really important for a successful cloud implementation or migration. So I, uh, that specialization led to uh, me becoming the competency lead on cloud networking within our uh, organization. Oh, that's that's fantastic. Yeah, I agree. Uh, networking really is, in some ways, even more critical to the success of a deployment uh, or project in cloud, given that unlike in a traditional data center where you kind of get your core set up and your DMZ set up and all of your VLANs and stuff, and you kind of build this monolithic engine network platform that's meant to kind of work in perpetuity, uh, cloud networking requires a different kind of thought process where you have to really think ahead and uh, anticipate some unexpected outcomes, right? So you have to build this network that's capable of immense change and growth. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And, and if you don't build it right or come in with the right kind of design principles, uh, it can be very harmful to the overall uh success of the business who's trying to scale and bring their apps to market quickly. The cloud is sold to them uh, as being flexible, scalable, you can really leverage your business and develop your products much quicker, but the network has to be able to follow that and, and be uh, often a critical success factor to, uh, to facilitate it. Absolutely. And with, you know, cloud networking skill sets kind of hard to come by, right, at the level of expertise required for enterprise. Um, I'm sure CloudDation has had a lot of success in helping your clients build and uh, construct, design, and maintain uh, the right kinds of cloud networks, right? So, Yeah, we early recognized that uh, not only networking, of, of course, security is also a foundation that needs to be involved in within a cloud project from, from the start. Cloud networking is, is definitely a, another one. Uh, and I'm often consultant in early stages uh, when we start to talk with customers or when we do an architecture session and trying to, uh, when we have to design a new environment or or an addition to an existing environment. And I'm often involved with those architecture sessions to uh, to, to transform the requirements into uh, into a drawing and then a rough outline, and then we can further build on that with specific services. Yeah, I, I want to go back to one of the things you highlighted um, as you were talking about uh, CloudNation's you know, success rate and the work you do with customers. And that was uh, how security needs to be involved early in the network design process. I, I find that to be absolutely true. And another one of those challenges that could be different than building in a traditional data center, right? It's the network and the security stance go hand in hand because of the way that security is essentially automated, right? Or should be automated in the cloud. And that those automations have a deep impact on the, the state of the network. Meaning that I can't just go in and slap a firewall in anywhere I want to without drastically disturbing the network outcome. Yeah. The more firewalls and security pieces that I add, the more complicated the whole network background uh, becomes, which again causes a big focus on redesign. And redesign is the thing that you kind of want to stay away from because it's expensive and it uh, it takes a lot of time. So if I add, may add to that, a, network, a firewall is not the only method to implement network security. 
Yeah, that's all. There's different kinds of network security. Like, for example, the, the zero trust approach, when you uh, really want to verify uh, remote work, workstations, uh, even if they're in tune managed by your own organization, but definitely if they don't bring your own devices by people you hire externally, you really want to check that security posture before you let them direct access to your AWS environment, for example. Yes. So have you used Aviatrix kind of uh, recently with some of your customers and designs, or have you been using Aviatrix uh, for a while now? We've been using Aviatrix stuff for a while. Uh, we have a customer where we implemented it a couple of years ago that is a managed uh, customer. We can uh, I can show the architecture diagram of that environment, and they're using it. Uh, uh, well, we are using it because we're managing it, but uh, to full full confidence and really, really satisfied with the stability and the ease of use. Every quarter, we uh, we check if there's a software update. And of course, we have to uh, update uh, Terraform versions and provider versions. Um, so that's very little maintenance for a very stable and well-performing environment. And if I can explain a little bit about CloudNation, we are part of a um, larger group of companies. They're called Atomic. They're, we were recently, it was rebranded to other companies involved our Uniserver, which is the largest private hosting company in the Netherlands, and uh, Revo Data, they specialize in Databricks. Of course, the combination of private and public cloud is really interesting for customers, but also from a commercial perspective for us. So what we're developing together is a managed hybrid connectivity service based on Aviatrix. We've built a demo environment since the Edge, was, uh, the Edge Gateway was re-released and uh, connected that to both AWS and Azure. Uh, so we can play around with it and uh, we got to know the edge behavior really well. So we now have a proposition for uh, for those customers uh, that are looking, that are currently in private cloud and are looking at public clouds. So we can uh, offer them a connectivity solution uh, with VPN, Direct Connect, Express Route, Single Cloud, Multi Cloud, and whatever they need, if they need additional security features or not or whatever. So uh, we want to, yeah, really want to be able to leverage those those customers that uh, connectivity is not something they need to worry about. That is so cool. So you're actually using Aviatrix as one of the key components in a SaaS platform to help customers it's, onboard cloud and connect to cloud. It's a service in development. We're, uh, we're still developing it, but uh, we see lots of opportunities for, uh, for it there. Oh, that, that is fantastic. Why don't you show me some of the things that you've been able to accomplish using Aviatrix with this customer here? I know um, there's probably a couple of interesting use cases you want to go over. Uh, definitely. All right, folks. So Mark has his diagram up here. So if you want to, again, follow along visually, just search in YouTube for Aviatrix Altitude and you'll get all of our YouTube episodes and you'll be able to find this one with Mark quite quickly. And if, again, you're just enjoying the podcast, we'll still step you through uh, the efficacy of this model so uh, you don't have to worry about it. So, all right, what are we looking at here, Mark? Um, we're looking at a diagram that's also been used in a uh, in a blog on our website. And this is basically the solution we built for a crypto trading platform uh, called Didibit. And they are located in uh, in the London region in an Equinix data center. Uh, so they host their, uh, their their trading backend systems in that data center. And they have a, they had quite a lot of customers that were running in AWS. So they were deploying EC2s and containers, whatever they needed to be able to contact the, um, the little bit trading systems. And they did that over the internet. That's the, the flow with the one uh, next to it. I see. And although they were in the, also in the London region, they still had quite some latency and jitter and, uh, did a bit of Connected, contacted us to request if we could help them build a solution that would provide direct connectivity from those AWS users, those those VPCs in the London region, directly to that backend. So, of course, the reconnect was uh, the first thing we thought of. Uh, so that was an easy part of the solution. And after some research, we found that uh, Amazon Private Link with creating an endpoint service would also be a really good fit because that would allow and yeah, that's really basically for service provider, service consumer models. So that's exactly what we're seeing here. Databit is providing certain services and they are exposing five TCP ports uh, by using a um, uh, private link. Those customers uh, wouldn't have to worry about overlapping IP ranges. And it's also a, only a one-way traffic model. It's the traffic only goes from the left, uh, from those customer VPCs to the, to the Databit VPC. 
uh, and not the other way around. So also from a security perspective, a really cool solution and it's really scalable as well. What we did was we created a um, uh, an endpoint service and the customers could uh, could look it up within the London region and connect to it. And then the traffic they sent over that endpoint service is uh, terminated on uh, a network load balancer. And that forwards the traffic over the direct connect to the uh, data center backend system. So really as much uh, as low latency as we can possibly get. Although we, run in, we ran into a challenge that um, Didibit uh, systems were reachable on public IP addresses and the network load balancer doesn't allow that. It only allows private IP addresses. So we needed some kind of, yeah, some kind of not uh, as a destination not. Um, so we looked at uh, Invertix, which was, which was a really cool fit because as a company, we use Terraform a lot. And uh, of course, Invertix also supports Terraform. So that was uh, a really good fit. And it also had some other advantages, like we could also do source knot uh, with gateways uh, sending um, traffic through one availability zone over the direct connect and the request would also, the answer would also come back through the same availability zone. And um, yeah, this was uh, this was built and, 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 and uh, tested with those customers and then uh, also later expanded to the Tokyo region. There, that's where Binance is located. And so quite often these companies are in, uh, are in Tokyo and also need to uh, uh, trade on really a bit. So that way we connect, we deployed a subset of the environment in the Tokyo region and connected, interconnected those transit gateways and uh, used the AWS uh, global backbone to, uh, to, to send that traffic from Tokyo to London. And uh, it's been performing really well uh, we, on the block on our website. We also have a, a screenshot of a monitoring tool that one of their customers used and there you can re clearly see the latency um, before they started using the private connectivity and and after it's it's a lot lower than uh, they experience a lot better performance wow all right so for the folks that are listening uh, on the podcast i'm going to re kind of review for you the the key components of this architecture that uh, Mark just went over and also for my own benefit to make sure I got it right. So you have these customers in AWS that uh, have virtual applications that are wanting to participate in this um, crypto platform, right? So it's a, uh, yeah. it's like a crypto exchange or a trading system. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. All right. And what they were doing prior to this aviatrix based architecture that uh, Mark developed is they were going out from that cloud region, AWS cloud region, wherever they were located over the internet, kind of all the way back around to the, the crypto platform, which is being hosted in a traditional data center, in this case in London. But of course the internet is, you know, not surprisingly, is not really the kind of network you want to use for a trading platform. Because as we know, trading platforms require really low latency and very high stability and milliseconds can count, right? Because when you execute your trade, uh, you need to make sure that that trade went through as opposed to the conditions of the of the price and the value of the share changing uh, between yeah. the time you execute your trade and the time it actually clears. Exactly the business case behind this. Yes. yes, yes. And in this case, what Mark did is he built a cloud native platform in AWS that was a direct B2B business to business outcome that instead of using the internet, the customers can connect over an Amazon private link, which means there's no need for peering uh, between their VPC and the service Aviatrix service VPC. So IP address overlap uh, is not a concern there and security is much better because it's that one way flow uh, into a private endpoint that the customer controls. And then Aviatrix backhauls this over direct connect, which is far more stable and uh, lower latency than the internet to the London data center. And again, what's really cool here is uh, the network load balancer, again, doesn't like to talk to uh, public endpoints. It only needs private endpoints. So what the Aviatrix gateways do is they expose a NAT that makes the backend application endpoints in the data center look like private endpoints that the network load balancer can do business with and bind to. And then on also on the way out, it changes the source address of the customer's packet to that of the gateway so that it essentially glues to or snaps to an availability zone um, and has a stateful response. This is fantastic. Did I miss any of the uh, critical details there? 
Uh, no, no. Uh, maybe one thing I would like to add is that, of course, in the beginning, uh, we, we created a manual for these customers, how they could connect to uh, to these backend systems. Not everyone succeeded uh, immediately, so we had to troubleshoot uh, with a couple of them, especially in the beginning. Uh, and then the uh, the packet capture feature uh, from the controller for these gateways was really, really useful. We could really easily filter out whether their packets were uh, were hitting the, the gateways or not, or if uh, something was going wrong before that. So uh, it made troubleshooting those connectivity issues uh, a lot easier. So let me just play devil's advocate here. When I was working in Azure, I built not exactly this platform, but many B2B platforms that used Azure Private Link in a similar kind of way. Uh, yeah. Although this is far more elaborate in some ways, but also simple. It's elaborate in terms of the function it does, but simple in terms of the design, which means it's a fantastic architecture. But in this case, customers might be looking to use, say, a Cisco device or a yeah. firewall device uh, instead of Aviatrix. And, you know, you could probably make that work. So, uh, you know, what was the interesting use case here where you decided for Aviatrix versus, you know, a, a virtual yeah. Juniper or Cisco or some other virtual networking device? Maybe I can explain that best by uh, using a practical example when we expanded the environment to the uh, Tokyo region. When we started this project, we received quite a small private side range to create the VPC in the London area. So, and we had an ant anticipated expansion to other regions. Uh, so when we got a request, we thought, well, then we need to resize the London area. And that means recreate the VPCs, uh, recreate subnets, etc. So we had to fully redeploy the London region and then also add with a Terraform apply, add to that the, the, the Tokyo region. And we managed to do that using Terraform uh, in 45 minutes. So we agreed on a maintenance window on a Friday afternoon. Uh, did a bit themselves of doing some maintenance that took about half an hour. And at the same time, we did a, a Terraform apply and the environment was redeployed. And we were uh, up and running uh, at about 45 minutes. Uh, but I am convinced this is only possible because we use some form of automation like Terraform and that integrated both the AWS and the Aviatrix services. And it would not have been possible if we had to do some of these things manually. Got it. Yeah. Automation, again, as we kind of kicked off at the beginning yeah. of, the, of the meeting, right, is key uh, to be successful in cloud networking. If you can't automate, you simply can't meet, uh, move at the speed of business. Uh, that's, that's rule number one, pretty much for me as a, as a network architect, like if it's not repeatable, if it's not, uh, you can't, you know, script it, you're, you're going to be in trouble. Yes. All right. So what's interesting about this diagram is that it looks like you're using the AWS dark fiber network to transit through Aviatrix, uh, the Tokyo traffic into perhaps the London region. In fact, that is the London region. I'm looking at the <laughs> diagram right now, yeah. uh, West two in London. And in uh, over the direct connect, and so the AWS uh, network is fast enough and stable enough, right, to make that latency acceptable. Is that correct? Definitely, and it's faster than uh, than the public internet. Yeah, yeah. So again, the, another secret to this architecture is being able to use a platform like Aviatrix multi-cloud networking software. Uh, doesn't have to be Aviatrix, right? We've discussed uh, some of the automation benefits of that, but from just a design perspective using the backbones of the cloud to transit regions, I have found is a very effective strategy for mitigating uh, latency and other you know, jitter problems on the internet and so forth. So yeah. in this case, the customer doesn't have to build another local data center in Tokyo. They don't have to build another uh, direct connect circuit from the Tokyo region to that Tokyo data center to accomplish the latency outcomes. So they're saving a tremendous amount of money with this Definitely. design, right? Yeah, and maybe one cool, advantage that we hadn't anticipated uh, earlier, but these requests from these customers over direct connect to the data center systems are really small. So there's quite, there's not that much traffic going out of uh, AWS. Most of the traffic, there's a lot, the, the responses from the backend systems are a lot bigger. So there's a lot more traffic going into AWS, but that of course is free. The direct connect data transfer cost is, uh, is quite low uh, in this solution. And that's, uh, yeah, that's a nice, nice advantage for the customer uh, that we hadn't thought of uh, at the beginning when we started this. Oh, you're so right. I mean, again, all I know is Azure because I'm a one trick pony. So you yeah. have to ex excuse me there. Now these prices may have changed, but some years ago when I was, you know, in that role, the about average price for traffic leaving an Azure region 
and traversing the internet was around 82, 83 cents uh, per gigabyte. And then leaving from Express Route, which is of course, you know, their version of Direct Connect, yeah. it was yeah. uh, 20 cents a gigabyte. Maybe I got my decimal wrong on that. Gosh, it's been so long. So it was either 8.3 cents a gig leaving the internet and then two cents a gig leaving Express Route. I'll have to go back yeah. and check my math on that. But my, it, may, it may be different in, in some regions as well. Yeah, that's right. But my point is, is that it was almost three times as expensive just based on the way the CSPs uh, incentivize their private connectivity to, to send traffic out of the internet. So yeah. just by virtue of funneling all that traffic through Direct Connect, and then also the bigger packets, the return traffic being free, customers going to save a bundle. So yeah. that's, that's fantastic. So this is a fantastic use case for obviously a bunch of things, the use of private link, the use of SNAT and NAT, the use of automation and private connectivity and cloud backbone. What about other interesting architectures or use cases? I know uh, you might have a couple other things to share. Yeah, I've run on multicast. That is not uh, something we used in Vietnam for, but it is something I'm very proud of that my, uh, especially a couple of my colleagues built. Yes. That's this architecture. It's for the same customer. And it was an additional request that they uh, that they came to us with that they were also starting a, a service where they offered crypto market data in the form of multicast flows. Of course, multicast is really efficient way of sending traffic uh, to multiple receivers, um, multiple uh, destinations and they need, that need the same information. As so it's yeah, it's, and I think it's the most efficient way to uh, to send it over a network. However. Direct Connect doesn't support uh, the multicast protocol. So we had to figure out, figure out a way uh, to work around that. Um, there were a couple of innovations with AWS, I believe it was just last year, that they had their native transit gateway where they now offered sharing uh, or at least offering uh, multicast domains. So the, that was a new feature for the AWS transit gateway. And it also became possible to share transit gateway attachment with other AWS accounts. Those were two developments on the AWS part that were really critical to this solution. So when these two came available, we thought, well, let's let's start the proof of concept and see how far we get to, uh, to get that multicast information from the data center to those same AWS customers. We still had to tackle something uh, regarding Direct Connect and what my colleagues uh, thought of together with engineers of the customer. And it, this was a really cool creative process that, that we went through together is that we, um, they had deployed a container in, uh, a Docker container in their data center that encapsulates, uh, TC, uh, multicast packets in TCP packets, and then sends that over direct connect. This, uh, is terminated on a network load balancer that then forwards it to a similar container running in AWS on ECS that then decapsulates those uh, TCP packets so that it's IGMP multicast again, that's forwards it to the AWS transit gateway. And, and by sharing uh, the domain uh, with also shared uh, TGW attachments, like I mentioned earlier, that traffic can then be uh, sent to those customer GPCs. So uh, this was also first created a proof of concept in the, uh, in the London region. And then that, again, that was replicated to the uh, to the uh, AWS Tokyo region. So for folks listening that might not be uh, quite the network propeller head that, that Mark and I are, <laughs> multicast is a UDP based protocol. That means it is basically stateless. It's like best effort delivery. It's meant to be very light, uh, lightweight and low overhead. And it uses a special range of IP addresses to essentially announce that it's multicast and to send these packets to multiple destinations that are in kind of the higher range of the, the IP address stack. And the cloud platforms and Azure is the same way, I don't know about GCP, typically do not support these destination addresses. So when the uh, cloud networking stack or, or SDN stack of the cloud sees as a destination, the special multicast address, it just drops the packet because yep. the ability to propagate and multiplex, basically copy these packets and then send them to all the multiple destinations. The multicast piece that they belong is tremendously complicated to pull off at scale in uh, the underlays of these clouds. It requires a lot of horsepower to copy and keep it in the tenant piece and get it right. It's, it's, it's hard science. So in order to get these packets through, what you have to do is tunnel them. 
Um, that means you have to disguise them as some other protocol that the cloud uh, SDN stack approves of. In this case, TCP is a, an obvious winner. Yep. I've seen some other solutions that were less elegant than this that used, you know, um, IPsec and some other tunneling protocols. So yeah. two questions here, why TCP and then why uh, containers as the envelopment engine that puts that sheathing over uh, UDP? Again, the yeah. traditional data center person would say, oh, just use a Cisco or Juniper or something. We started off with some tunneling protocol, but then we, uh, we deployed a virtual appliance from, from another uh, vendor. What she added seemed to work, but then that, what's the protocol again? Like GRE or? Yeah, G GRE. Uh, yeah, but that wasn't yeah. supported by the on-premise uh, router. So yeah. that one, uh, we had to drop that solution. So then our customer did a bit works a lot with uh, with containers. And of course, we as a cloud public cloud native consulting company, we work a lot with container solutions as well. So this was actually a no-brainer because it's uh, really easy to update, it's easy to scale. Uh, ECS is uh, it's self healing. If a container fails, it's automatically spent up again. So yeah, this was this was uh, for us an ideal way to uh, to 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 build the solution. So yeah, what I'm what I'm hearing there again is a, again no surprise. Use things that are purpose built for cloud. Use things that scale quickly and efficiently. Use yeah. things you can automate. Use That's things right. that benefit from the continuous integration, continuous development, CI/CD process. Um, so again, you can move at the speed of business in cloud. Yeah. So these are fantastic takeaways. So Mark, how did you first learn about Aviatrix? Uh, and you know, how did you get up to speed on the platform? I got in touch with Aviatrix uh, when I first met Gino, Gino Mommers, uh, who is on the sales side of Aviatrix in our EMEA region. Uh, he had just joined the company and was really looking for uh, partners in, uh, in, in the Benelux and in our area. I, I, I already had a networking background. I was really interested in solutions. And I had also uh, encountered the name in, a, in, the, um, in the former study guide for the AWS networking specialty mm -hmm. exam. So the, the name already was familiar. So then it got me really interested. And uh, Gino gave some demos together with Dennis, his, uh, his, his technical right hand uh, in, in our area. And I was immediately convinced of the, uh, of, of the use cases for, for certain customers. So, um, followed the initial ACE training, uh, the associate and then the professional one, not, not too much later, the, uh, uh the data bit, uh, customer case came along. So uh, we were able to, uh, apply the skills we had already learned. That's the short version of the story. Oh, that's, that's, that's fantastic. Gino's good people, man. He's a yes. super good guy. Uh, one of my favorite people at Aviatrix. Even though he's a sales guy, he feels like the least salesy sales guy out there. You yeah. know, it's like, eh, he's just kind of a regular guy that you want to talk with and, and learn from. So uh, yeah. it's certainly part of his appeal. It feels, it feels trusted. Uh, like he, like yeah. he's an old friend, you know, you've, you've known him for a long time, always honest, uh, no hidden agenda. So um, just overall, who guy to work with. And so did he recommend ACE for you? Because I know you've done some ACE training. And in fact, I know that you are an ACE DE, and that is a very impressive accomplishment, right? You have to go through so much training uh, to get the DE uh, title. So first, congrats on that. Thank you. Talk to me just a little bit about your experience with the program. What are some of the favorite things you learned and what are some of your interesting moments to share? The ACE program in general is just really practical. It, 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 it highlights the things you run into as a network architect or a network engineer when you start building uh, customer environments in, in the public cloud or uh, with hybrid or multi-cloud situations. And it's, especially the professional, it's also hands-on. So you really get your hands dirty on uh, deploying stuff in a lab environment that's really well prepared. So you don't lose any time building stuff yourself before you can start learning. So it's really well prepared and also including, it, it includes Terraform deployment, uh, uh, co-pilot. So it's really complete and um, if you have, it's, it's also really flexible. If you have any things you would like to focus on yourself, like security or OCI, and it's not that often used with customers, then there's also a possibility. Well, Mark, thank you so much for all of your valuable uh, input and wisdom on today's show. It's fantastic. I just want to remind people, Mark is really one of the top network design engineers in the world. He has been so gracious uh, to give us. That. I don't think so. I'm I just think so. <laughs> well, 
it let, you know, that's your job is to be humble. My job is to, uh, to, to tell the truth. So he's been really gracious with his time today. And uh, again, as you can see, based on the just quality and outcome of his architectures, if you're needing a little network help or a lot of network help, make sure you keep Cloud Nation handy and think about Mark. They are obviously doing fantastic work and building some gorgeous things for their customers. Multicast is one of the hardest things to solve. Um, from a networking perspective in cloud and Mark has solved it for one of his big customers. So kudos to you and Mark, just best of luck. Thanks for being on the show and uh, hope we stay in touch. Thanks for having me. You're welcome.